Previously, as Haruki went to Akani's shop and opened the door, he noticed the duo on the floor sweating and trembling, and no, it's not what you think sadly. He asked about their well-being, but they appeared too fatigued to respond, particularly Karen. She also noticed that Haruki had gotten stronger. She was on the verge of divulging something about the 10th level of the garage dungeon, but Akani intervened. Haruki desired to witness it himself, so he ventured to the dungeon. Akani trailed behind supporting Karen who was too anxious to walk unaided. He couldn't help but notice the equipment Karen wore known as Banma, which led him to realize she was an employee of Ichibishi. Akani explained she had no alternative because Ichibishi didn't manufacture weapons of that kind. When he asked about its efficiency, she explained that a Tonfa integrated with both offense and defense with jet engine blades was quite efficient. But he was wearing something weird as well. It was the Lizard Man's defense armor. It had a considerable defense against slash attacks. Still, it was a cloth-type equipment so he should be careful about blunt attacks. When she asked how he got it, he said that he was the only one who could equip it among the members who were there, so he got it. Akane couldn't figure out what he was trying to become and he said he only wanted to level up his rank. Haruki then asked why they came to the dungeon earlier and she explained that it was because she had a fight with Karen the other day, and she was almost lost because she was shot by one of her spells. They then decided to have a hunting competition, but Haruki didn't understand why she started something like that. She explained that she decided to watch over Karen as she was a sponsored candidate for Ichibishi. Haruki was taken aback. He found it suspicious that a non-ranker adventurer signing a contract with a company, but it was because she was using magic. Haruki was counting on Akani as she would be taking care of Karen. He congratulated Karen even though it was frustrating for him. Karen was feeling sorry that she had to leave him when he helped her all this time. Haruki didn't mind that as an issue, and asked if there was any way she could help him but she immediately refused. In his case, it was better to put his face on an ad balloon and send it far away. They arrived at the 10th floor and the girls wanted him to go first. He was wondering what happened to them to act like that but the moment he asked, he was faced with the cause of their weirdness. A giant earthworm was standing in front of him but all he said was how cute it was. He cut it in half without any trouble. Its skin was quite elastic. While he was killing it, Akane was about to get eaten by one of the worms and he decided to save her. However, a sudden explosion happened and it was Karen's lightning magic. Karen was feeling dizzy and Akane was holding her when he stated that her magic was amazing. Karen asked if they were going to eat that worm but it wasn't an earthworm, it was Lutz. It was a sea creature washed up on the beach the day after the storm. Despite its grossness, it was delicious. He offered some to Karen as the greatest contributor. Akane wanted to try some too but he asked her why she allowed her head to be chomped in the first place when she was so strong but Akane did not like bugs. While they were arguing, Karen tried the Lutz and it was so delicious that she teared up a little. Akane wanted to try it but there was no food for the ones who didn't work. The next day they were at the dungeon and Haruki asked if that was magic from yesterday's thunder and she guessed it was. He asked how long she was able to use it. Ever since the divine protection appeared it somehow felt like she could do it, as she said. He then wondered why she wanted to show Akane her magic but she wanted to keep it a secret. He didn't insist on anything and checked the skill board which was updated. He mentioned that he found out that increasing your divine protection would make you stronger so asked if she wanted to test it. She thought about it for a second and wanted to leave it as it was. When he asked the reason, she said that she wanted to improve her level a little more by using her own power. It's important for her to know that she won't understand the true challenge of gaining significant power through her efforts, unless she actively works towards growing stronger herself. If she becomes too complacent, she may struggle to put in the same level of effort in the future. She didn't need to explain herself more to him as he understood her. He wanted to be strong and in the end, that feeling was empowering when driven into the corner or on the verge of failure. He decided that they would need to test that resolve of her right away. Karen wondered how he managed to cut the one meter wide boss with his dagger, and if it was a new skill, but it was just a normal attack. An example was bamboo splitting. Karen didn't seem to agree with him. Because of the power, weakness exploit that manifested due to divine protection, and she felt like he was not human anymore. Karen had a point but he didn't really understand the basics of swordsmanship, and he must have been making useless movements without knowing it. Haruki was considering looking for a dojo but she seemed worried that if he started going there she would go solo dive again. Karen didn't think dojo would be any help to him but before she could say anything he scared her while saying there were a lot of things he could learn just by going to a dojo. Even when he wasn't training he could just watch and steal some skills. Suddenly he got an idea and went home. He started watching swordsmanship videos and practicing. Thanks to his imitation skills, he could finally see the movements. While practicing, he figured that the grip strength was the key. Also, just by increasing the range of the motion, speed was also increased. It was just a mere change, but it changed things a lot. However, he still had a long way to go. Those master swords had a flow, and if he followed that, 
he wouldn't need to use his unnecessary strength anymore. He adjusted his breathing and gave it another try. In the next scene, Haruki at the dungeon to practice on the monsters. He seemed to have a lot of improvements, but it wasn't enough since he's got that main character. He had no choice but to practice until he got used to it so he killed them over and over again. He ended up hunting all night and felt like deja vu. There were two conditions that needed to be fulfilled for a skill to increase, acquiring experience and using the skills one wants to increase. On the contrary, if he doesn't want to level it up, that means he shouldn't do it a lot. He decided to do point distribution after he got some sleep and in the end, he overslept. They were fighting with the 11-3 floor boss and they managed to beat it. They proceed to the 12th floor with lots of motivation. There was a meadow again on the 12th floor and the grass was yellow. He noticed that something was wrong with Rhea. He had never seen her react like that and he decided to expand the detection's range. He sensed something and immediately warned Karen. They started to get surrounded by thousands of rice grasshoppers. He wondered if Rhea was upset because they were her natural enemy, but those rice grasshoppers tasted like shrimp, which he loved. They started to cut them, but there were just too many to handle. He decided to retreat and Karen noticed something. They were fighting for something, and when Haruki noticed someone, he immediately decided to use all his strength to defeat that herd. Karen didn't understand the sudden change in his decision, so he explained that they were after the rice plants which had larger grains and were very delicious. He was dedicated to saving the silver rice. Karen was looking at him with disappointment on her face. The day was over, and Karen was leaving his house, and she thanked him for the food. It had been a while since they had rice, so he got excited. Haruki asked if she needed him to drop her off at her hotel, but she was planning to hunt a little. He told her to not push herself too much, and she left. Karen was feeling down because he got stronger again. She believed their levels had gotten a little close, but it was certain for her that he would leave her behind. Since the raid, he had been leveling up really fast and grew more and more. She wanted to be of help to him so she decided to do dungeon diving by herself that night even though she knew it wasn't enough. She slapped herself really hard to not think negatively and focused on her goal of catching up to him. She was about to start defeating the monster and realized that Haruki was also there, practicing with his dagger. He noticed a baby centipede and decided to hunt it for now, but its head was too tough and it was so fast. He got excited since it could be some kind of rare species. He followed the centipede and was about to catch it, but Rhea shot him. Rhea told him to not bully him and stated that he wasn't a bad kid. Even if she said that, Haruki didn't seem to be listening to her. She held the centipede and said that she would take care of him. Haruki wondered if he was okay with it and the centipede approved him. Even though he wasn't sure, he said that they would welcome him if he was willing to join them. He let him climb on his arm and the baby centipede rubbed his head on him which made him almost die from its cuteness. He checked his skill board and he seemed strong and had a high initial value and he had skills that Haruki had never seen before. He then tried to find a name for him, but it was hard for him to find the right name. After so many failed name suggestions, the centipede seemed to like the name Esta, from Vesta, the goddess of hearth in Roman mythology. Once again, he stated that he was looking forward to working with Esta. Meanwhile, Akane was appreciating the weather. She then noticed a Death Eater on the roof of Haruki's house. Death Eater Bug was a monster that appeared in the middle of Shinjuku, and it was extremely quick, making it difficult to attack. If there was even one Death Eater insect in a herd of monsters, even veteran teams would be annihilated in no time. She tried to wake Haruki up to let him know that there was a bed news for it to be there. He explained that the Death Eater she was talking about was his friend Esta. It was a useful insect and was a pest control expert. It was also Rhea's favorite. The reason for that is because rice grasshoppers, Rhea's natural enemy, were its favorite food. Their interests aligned, he thought. Akane was speechless by his comfortable words. It was now time to show Esta to Karen. When she asked what happened, he explained that he recruited a new team member and he introduced her. Karen didn't seem to believe that thing would protect the house and Haruki got defensive thinking she would think about wolves. The way Haruki got so defensive about his centipede showed that he actually wanted a wolf. Karen mentioned that whenever she took her eyes off him, he did something outrageous. They then went to the 14th floor of the dungeon. Haruki noticed that Karen's divine protection went up which he claimed that it was because they beat the boss on the 13th floor while also wondering if she was finally curious about the name of the god that protects her. He asked if it was time they reallocate her points, but she refused, and told him to leave it as it was as she still wanted to do her best. He didn't insist on that and warned her about the traps in the area. The fact that there was water on the floor meant that aquatic monsters would appear. He wondered if there would be fish and frogs. Suddenly something appeared, but it was just a slimy eel. But they looked a bit different compared to the ones he saw at the shop. He cut them one by one and they brought all of them to Akini's house's front yard to have a barbecue. Akane was mad as hell but he was sure she would like it when it was done. He offered some Donbury and asked if she found anything about the boss on the 14th floor. Akani mentioned that from what she observed it was a replica of an eel. 
It contains a lot of anti-monster properties, but it was less effective compared to the originals. He decided to give it to Karen, but she strictly refused it, so he gave it to Rhea. They moved to the 15th floor the next day. The air was dry, and it was a vast plain. It felt like a grassland. Not so long later, they both felt a big threat near them. Haruki remembered that feeling he got, and it was a werewolf standing right in front of them. At that time, he didn't want to fight something like that again, but right now he felt excited. He wanted to test how much he had grown since then, or how close the gap between them was. Before he made his first attack, he was glad that it was finally there. Karen was watching him being so excited while fighting with a deadly monster. Karen wanted to contribute too, so she used her lighting skills, but it didn't work. It moved so fast that she couldn't hit it continuously. Haruki said that he would distract it and told her to calm down and hit it once again. Haruki focused and tried to look closely, match its movements, find a good point, and tell her the right time to start. Karen, Rhea, and Haruki attacked it at the same time, and the wolf was dead. Haruki was amazed by Karen's good shop. They were so happy but couldn't celebrate it since level up sickness hit them. He was glad that there were no other werewolves around. After they were feeling better, Haruki suggested fighting them near the gate as some noticed the fight, so a couple of them had started to move. They killed a bunch of wolves and Karen seemed to get used to it. They had gained a lot of experience, a lot of materials and got some training too. The habits of individual werewolves. Their attacks, temperament and movements differed from each werewolf. While trying to cope with them, they felt like they were fighting different monsters every time. That sounded pretty fun to Karen and Haruki agreed. One week later they were at the dungeon and suddenly, the dungeon started to glow and it was the phenomena that occurred after the dungeon boss was subjugated. If that was the case, they were wondering who on earth could it be. They couldn't believe the boss died on its own. They wondered if there were any circumstances that may have resulted in the phenomenon, but that seemed impossible to Haruki. Something was coming towards them. It seemed like a person and when it got closer they saw the top ranker Shigure. They were confused because there was no way she could be there. Haruki called for her but she disappeared and appeared right in front of him in less than a second. Apparently she was looking for him and finally found him. She asked if he was rumored as a mask and he didn't even know about that. When he asked Karen, she said that she saw a little bit of it on the internet. He asked Shigure what kind of rumor she heard and she explained that someone who cleared the monster parade by himself on the upper floors of Chikaho and subdued the middle class monster parade together with Kagamitsu. It was indeed Haruki. He felt extremely happy that a top ranker heard of him. She described someone who had a mask that floated in the air, carried a plant on his back, used a familiar tentacle, and repelled monster attacks with his scaly body but that didn't sound like him so he denied it. He hoped her to be wrong but Karen said that the description fit him so well. While he was in a breakdown from the rumors he had heard, Shigure asked if he would indulge in a game with her for a while. In the next scene they were trying to spot a place to fight. Karen was still shocked that he really agreed to fight with her. He couldn't refuse since she had come all the way here for him. However, she reminded him that fighting between fellow adventurers was prohibited, but it was fine since they would make it like a game. Also, to fight a top ranker like her was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The sword was the famous Blood Sakura. Haruki found the sword so cool as its radiance and cutting style make one's heart fall into the dark side. Moreover, only professionals use katana. It shows the user's high skills from the way they handle it. Shigure stated that the name was randomly given by her teammate. However, she did not dislike it. Haruki seemed super excited and left the start signal to Rhea. The fight wouldn't take long, but he would like to see Shigure's movements. Even if it was just a little, he wanted to copy it. Rhea shot towards the sky to give the start sign and Sigura was already at his throat before the stone Rhea shot landed on the floor. He lost and it wasn't even about copying anymore. She was on a whole other level that he couldn't even see anything. Shigure wanted to do it again and told him to get up. Even though he didn't notice, Haruki reacted to her first attack. Until now, not even Masatsugu could react to her Shukichi at first glance. On the other hand, not only did he react to her Shukichi, he tried to catch it with his short sword and dodge it. If that sword had reached her the second he saw her strike, it would have been her who would have lost. That was why she wanted to confirm it herself. She told him to have a good match. Karen was watching them fighting and the difference between their abilities was overwhelming and wondered when their game would be over. Shigure seemed to be getting tired too and Haruki finally stopped her strike. She knew that Haruki was able to keep up with her movements. Haruki fell to the ground because he got so exhausted. Shigure had been studying the area of drawing one's sword, cutting down one's opponent, and sheathing the sword afterwards since she was a child. She became an adventurer to improve her skills. She had been using heavy swords in order to freely improve her skills. The dungeon was the best place to strengthen her body and improve her physical ability. She quit the team which was located in Chiba, and decided to go on a journey to gain more practical experience to reach the very heart of swords. During her journey she overheard some rumors about the masked adventurer, the one who broke through the upper floor in Chikaho and the monster parade alone. 
She asked people to tell her more about that story. It piqued her interest. She wondered why there were rumors about him and why Masatsugu knew him. But after fighting with him over and over again, she understood the reason. She bowed to her while sweating and trembling in exhaustion and wanted to fight it again. The sun rose and they fought over and over again until Haruki fainted. Karen was worrying about him and Shigure spilled some healing potion in his face, but he didn't want her to waste on someone like him. Shigure smiled, saying that although she hit him with the back of the sword, she could strike him too hard so she wanted him to consider that as an apology. Haruki stated that he learned a lot from the game they had played and thanked her. She also thanked him as she had a lot of fun. Before she left, Haruki asked if she still couldn't get back to Tokyo and she approved him. Haruki wondered if she would also be participating in the Shinjuku recapture operation. After a few seconds of silence, Shigure asked what was that in a scary manner. They sat and Haruki explained to her the situation. She didn't know anything about that and felt embarrassed. He showed her the things on the net and told her that Masatsugu had rescued Bacon and she may catch a train to Shinjuku to meet up with them. After thinking for a while, Shigure wanted to stick to her real plan and decided to go to Chikaho. She was sure that if Masatsugu was there, it would be fine. Haruki thought it would be better to have more people, but she didn't think there would be any need for her as Masatsugu was already an expert. Karen remembered that Shigure and Masatsugu had a practice match and Shigure had won. But Masatsugu was better when it came to clearing a dungeon floor while Shiura excels in fighting against other people. If those two worked together, it would be possible to subjugate all monsters in Shinjuku rather than just recapturing them. Shigure left and left them wondering if she was okay. Akane came and made fun of him for getting thrashed by Shigure. Haruki asked what she was doing and she explained that she was preparing for winter and Katoro was also there. She wanted to offer him something but he ignored her and they started to walk home to prepare dinner. Akane stopped him and apologized for provoking him. When he asked what she wanted, she said that she had a request for him. Her request was to collect thermal stones from Nakatsunai Dungeon. Haruki asked why didn't she ask the adventurers in that area. She said that she wanted to but most of the adventurers were going to Shinjuku. Because of the operation to retake Shinjuku, the requests handled by intermediate adventurers were being delayed. She wasn't saying that retaking Shinjuku was a bad thing, but at the same time, they must also avoid the shortage of the thermal stones. Thermal stones were indispensable for armor crafting. If there were no adventurers collecting them, the makers couldn't manufacture armor, and adventurers all over the country would have a hard time exploring dungeons. Haruki accepted her request, and she needed 100 kilograms of thermal stones. Haruki asked Karen what she was planning and asked if she wanted to tag along, but Akane reminded her that she was focusing on leveling up so she had to refuse his offer. They sent Haruki off and Akane wanted to tag along as she leveled up. Karen thanked her all Akane was planning was to make Karen stronger than Haruki he realized how awesome she was. Karen wanted to ensure that she didn't get left behind, but Akane's repeated attacks by monsters hindered her progress. Meanwhile Haruki was at the entrance of the Nakasatsunai dungeon. Despite the fact that there was a shortage of people, there were quite a few there. Since there were very few intermediate level ones, most of them were rookies. He wished good luck to one of them but they seemed to be scared of him. The flower on his back and the centipede on his body weren't helping him either. The rumors about him were all over the net and people were talking about how they saw him and how he was really friendly even though he looked dangerous. Haruki reached the 10th floor in just two days which means his pace was good. It was a shame that Esta's divine protection hadn't manifested yet. He guessed that it could be because the level of the dungeon was low. He asked if there was a specific skill Esta wanted and she wanted to get even tougher. They continued to explore the dungeon as the thermal stones should be around there. At the same time, Karen and Akane were at the dungeon, and Karen wondered if it was safe to leave the collection of the thermal stones to Haruki. She looked it up yesterday and found that it was difficult to collect if you were by yourself. Akane stated that it would be easy for Haruki. There were two reasons for that. Firstly, he had the magic bag that changes things completely, and the other reason was his good eyes. In his last fight with Shigure in the second half, Haruki got a good grasp of Shigure's movements, and it wasn't just that. It had been only a couple of months since he became an adventurer. It would be impossible to see through Shigure's first move like he did. Shigure became impatient after being seen through, little by little he imitated her movements. So it would be a piece of cake to distinguish stones with those eyes. It was a normal request where he went about collecting thermal stones and then placing them on the counter where the rest was handled by the clerk. Meanwhile at the same time, he was being questioned by the police. The police told him to take off his mask and when he did he disappeared. They were looking at his card and he wanted to have it back which scared them. They apologized for keeping him waiting and wished him good luck. Haruki teared up thinking they were worried about him. The clerk Akane mentioned before and the police who wished him good luck was talking about him. The police said that he was normal and it was foolish of him to get frightened when he took off his mask. It was also true that he disappeared when he took off his mask. 
He mentioned that if you tell him good luck, he would skip around weirdly, which seemed like a good guy. The clerk said that it was because he made him happy. The clerk said that around dusk when it was closing time, Haruki appeared with his mask and it was as if it was floating in the air up and down. Haruki came near to him and wanted to sell something. It was a nightmare to him as he said. What's more, he placed 25 kilograms of thermal stones on the counter. He had never bought that much before so he was surprised. People on the net didn't believe he collected them by himself as one could only collect up to 4 or 5 kilograms in a day and claimed that he had companions but the clerk was sure that he was by himself. The people didn't know what to believe anymore. Since he did well today, he was celebrating with local chicken chunky and green soybeans. In the next scene, Masatsugu, Bacon, and Shigure chatted in the same room. Bacon wondered where Shigure had been and she said that her teammates scolded her. They said next time she forgot to charge her phone, they would throw away her sword collection so she came there in a hurry. Masatsugu started to talk about the boss. The boss looks identical to a rare deer species that inhabits the 24th floor of the dungeon. It had a special attack that doesn't let you move if it touches you which is what happened to Bacon. When she asked for more detail, he said that it was similar to when she pulled or tore her muscles. She asked if it was a curse but Masatsugu didn't have any idea. There was a possibility it was a hypnosis. He tried all the medicines he had brought on him but the only thing that worked was the panacea even though Bacon thought it was the protein that worked. She asked how long the symptoms lasted and seemed quite long. He gathered as much medicine as he could which took them quite some time. Shigure asked what was her role and Masatsugu said that she would be the attacker. They were planning to surround the boss and assault all at once. Bacon warned her about the deer's purple lumps and if the monsters spawned she should leave them to other rankers. Bacon also advised her not to underestimate it just because it was a small fry which sounded like he was speaking from experience. They ended their conversation and Masatsugi was alone in the room. He was storing all the conversations in the log. If the recapture operation failed and they died, he would like that log to be used as a reference for countermeasures. He then left the room. Meanwhile, Akani and Esta were freaking out because of the weird slimy eels. Haruki was regretting some of his decisions but Karen surprised him. She wasn't trying to defeat them in one blow like she used to and now she was controlling her power. He was glad that she changed her way of fighting and improved. Still, he was wondering why they couldn't pass through there. They begged for his help. While they were moving, Akani stated that she was glad they were able to break through the 14th floor. When they arrived on the next floor, Akani and Haruki sensed something. The atmosphere was definitely different from back then, and it was like they were getting chills down their spines. Haruki decided to postpone their training. Karen was confused and Akani explained that a rare species may have appeared. Haruki asked what they should do and she said they should run. He said that if it was really a rare species, they would leave it to a high-ranking adventurer and ask her opinions. It was fair enough for Akani. He sensed something and whispered to everyone to get down. And there it was, the deer. Akani already knew that it was dangerous. She said it was from another dungeon and was normally found on the 24th floor. If it was a rare species, it could cause a stampede. Karen and Haruki were taken aback by her words. He asked if she could defeat it but it was indeed impossible. If there was another attacker like her, it might make a difference though. He asked if she could put in a subjugation request. She could, but getting the adventurers would be up to Oiso. It was out of her jurisdiction. Karen asked what they should do now while trembling in fear. Haruki said that Karen would be in charge of contact which means he was planning to stay there. His plan was to keep an eye on the deer. Karen found it dangerous but he had a bad feeling about how there were no wolves in the area. It wasn't doing anything in particular so he wanted to gather a little more information to allocate his skill points, but then noticed that Esta's divine protection had manifested. He would allocate her points. He learned that Esta was another minor god. It was one of the pillar deities shown in Japan's national treasure painting Scroll Extermination of Evil. It was thought that the god of bugs protected the country from epidemics. Rhea got jealous and wanted him to raise her level as well. Suddenly, a werewolf appeared and the deer shot the wolf with something abnormal coming out of its mouth. It defeated the werewolf by hitting it with a purple lump and leveled up which made Haruki speechless. Haruki realized that as time passed, no one would be able to defeat it. He tried to find a way to defeat it but he knew he couldn't. He shouldn't get conceited. It wasn't that easy to defeat a higher ranking monster even with the help of skill board. He shouldn't be impatient and needed to stay focused until the last second. However, it had been three days and Karen tried to stay calm since he was Haruki, even though some bad thoughts were coming to her mind. When she arrived, she saw him looking at the skill board with sleepless eyes, trying to find a way to defeat the deer. Karen asked if he rested, but he said that staying up three nights in a row was nothing compared to when he was a corporate slave. Karen told him to get some rest as he wouldn't be able to do anything if there was an emergency. Haruki explained that he would be fine as long as he had that tonic he got from Akane, but that was absolutely crazy to Karen. 
Karen excitedly told him that the request was accepted by one person. He was grateful that even one person accepted it, but he didn't believe it would make any difference. Karen also mentioned that the Shinjuku recapture operation would begin soon. The top rankers like Masatsugu, Bacon, and Shigure had gathered, and Haruki was now sure that they would succeed. Haruki then drank the tonic and regained his energy. He would now keep an eye on the deer and told Karen that he would be leaving the adventurer who would come to her. Suddenly, Karen and Haruki felt the extreme presence of the deer. Haruki told Karen to run and head to Akani but the deer was already too close to them. It made that purple lump again and was about to hit Karen but Haruki jumped to save her. The purple lump melted on his body. Haruki was lying there motionless. His body was melting and Karen couldn't do anything but feel guilty. The deer was still there to kill her. She didn't know what to do. The deer tried to shoot her and she barely dodged it. Karen knew that she couldn't fight it there or else Haruki would be in danger. She started to run opposite direction to drive the deer away. She felt extremely guilty for being weak. A few years ago, their school ended all of a sudden in the third period and her teacher didn't tell her anything. She was wondering what was that stinky smell just before she noticed a dog was tearing a man apart. She was so scared and couldn't even run away. Her parents came and her mother embraced her tightly while her father shielded himself. Her mother also let her go and sacrificed herself for Karen. The thought of that moment her parents getting killed by a wolf distracted her, and she fell to the ground. She didn't want to lose anyone anymore and also didn't want to lose the people around her. She was crying and seemed like she accepted her fate. She then heard a voice asking her if she was going to stop now. A man with a beard was talking to her, saying that even when it comes to taking a monster's life and saving someone's life, she hasn't even tried to risk anything. She realized that it was the noise she had been hearing lately. The man called her fake and she denied it. He asked what she was scared of and she said that she was losing those important to her because she was weak. The man then told her to prepare herself and give it her all while she was holding on to those feelings. He told her to risk her body and life if she still wanted power. She was indeed sure that she wanted to protect those who were important to her. He told her to take his hand and rebel against despair. She held his hand and their power became together. She used her real true power and defeated the deer with one attack. Defeating it caused Haruki to heal and wake up like nothing happened. He told her that it was pretty impressive and she really surprised her like he wasn't almost dead. She couldn't believe he was standing there when he was covered with the purple lump earlier. She seemed like she got mad at him so he apologized but she was actually relieved that he wasn't dead. He was surprised that she cared about him that much. He patted her head and thanked her. After she calmed down she asked how she survived. Haruki said it was probably thanks to Esta. She had a skill called quarantine and she covered him so he was safe. Leaving that beside, he asked Karen if she needed time to concentrate when she released powerful magic. Karen said that she didn't shoot right away and explained that she heard a voice every time she went into the dungeon and when she responded to that voice her magic was improved. Haruki checked her skill board and her divine power was at max. And it was Okikurumi. Okikurumi was a hero god who appeared in the Ainu mythology. He was also called an Ainu as a human-like god. Haruki mentioned that he fought for humankind and brought peace to the world. It was the perfect divine protection for an adventurer from Hokkaido. Haruki's divine power was from Egypt and he didn't know the reason. Suddenly they noticed that the deer was standing. It was surely resilient as it could still stand after that lightning attack. Karen dedicatedly told Haruki to allocate all her skill points to magic. She knew it was difficult to manipulate when magical power increases but he must do it. Haruki was impressed that she was changed. She used to be nervous and scared of fighting but now he could see her determination. He allocated all of it and they collectively started to attack the deer. Its hide was so hard that he couldn't even cut it. But with Karen's magical power if he kept attacking they would defeat it for sure. However, the deer released its lump and werewolves started to appear from the lump and their color was the same as that lump before. Haruki realized that the deer not only killed the werewolves, it also made them into its subordinates that it could control. They decided to break through and head toward the stairs. They were not weak but there was also no end to the monsters, and it was getting worse. They kept fighting and were getting tired of it. Haruki got distracted and was about to get killed by one of the monsters but unexpectedly, Kagamitsu came and saved him. Haruki was shocked that he was there and asked him why he had come. Kagamitsu said that he heard Haruki was in a bind so he came, which means that the only adventurer who accepted his request was him. Haruki got emotional that he came to save him while he was already cutting the monsters. He was amazed by Karen's power and asked Haruki what was her attack. He said that it was magic and said it was a confidential matter so he needs to keep quiet about that. Kagamitsu also noticed the things on Haruki's body. He introduced Esta as their new companion while chopping off monsters. Kagamitsu wasn't sure he was needed there was Karen's power was no joke and the flower and the bug were also strong. More importantly, Haruki's speed and strength were nothing like before. The most troublesome was the deer. 
Its characteristics matched the deer that Masatsugu and the others were talking about on the bulletin board. It wasn't the time to think about the things he didn't know, so he tried to focus on beating the monsters. If Haruki and he combined their strength, then they would win for sure, he thought. Firstly, they would reduce the number of werewolves, and then the deer was alone, they would attack it. He told Haruki to leave that side to him which he understood like he needed to fight with the boss. He got so hyped up by that idea and with all his strength he decided to break through the path with all he had. He noticed the werewolves' weak points and there was a path of light that connected them. The only thing he needed to do was to just stay on that path and kill them all. He was so focused that he was killing them one by one without any trouble. Karen noticed him and how he was rushing in by himself. She wanted to help him and recalled a memory of Akani telling him that her role was to control the area from behind and she needed to be able to get a good shot from a long distance. She didn't have any experience yet but she believed in her strength and focused on the power she was given by the human god. Kagamitsu was watching her, impressed. She successfully killed a large number of werewolves in one attack. Haruki and Kagamitsu were amazed by her power. The boss's way was now free, and Haruki made a close attack. Haruki gave him a chance to make another attack. Rhea, Esta, and Haruki all made an attack and injured the deer. After fighting with it for a while he managed to stab it from its deadly point. The deer's corpse fell to the ground and Haruki fainted from being exhausted. Meanwhile, Akani was wondering about them. In case something happened, she was prepared to move. Since she saw Kagamitsu entering the dungeon, she was almost sure they would be fine. She entered the dungeon with a big entrance but when she saw their miserable situation she started to cry her eyes out thinking it was her fault. Kagamitsu tried to comfort her by saying everyone was alive but she wasn't listening. Akane was crying and said that she was going to come in a cool way and do them all a favor. She didn't understand why things turned out this way. She was not a contractor for dismantling these. Meanwhile, Akane sighed and saw the monster that she was fighting increase again. She didn't like the situation. Kagamitsu said to Karen that why did she even come there and said to her, he appreciated her help and added that he was fine now. After that he wanted Karen to go help Akane. Haruki said to Kagamitsu that he had something to talk about with him. Karen left to help Akane. Then Haruki wanted Kagamitsu to know that he appreciated his help. Kagamitsu said to Haruki that he helped during the Chikano incident so it was all fine. All of a sudden Kagamitsu shouted to Haruki why he rushed towards the boss by himself. Haruki hesitated about what to say and he added that he left that side to him. Kagamitsu got angry and told Haruki that he would not have let Haruki do such a dangerous thing. Haruki was kind of amazed. Then Kagamitsu said to him that if they had continued to reduce the number of werewolves in that manner, even without any suicidal attacks they could have easily won. Kagamitsu got angry, he squeezed Haruki's cheek and warned Haruki not to give him any kind of reaction. Haruki said to Kagamitsu that they still won. Kagamitsu realized that Haruki was right. However, for Kagamitsu it was Karen magic that made that possible. Haruki was aware that if he spoke about Karen magic once she would be in danger. Still he rushed into her with that thunder. Haruki said that Karen never missed a shot so, this time as well, he had faith in her and charged ahead. Then Kagamitsu needed to go because something urgent had come up as he said. Kagamitsu asked him not to talk about the battle and not post online too, and added not revealing it would eliminate any chance of obtaining information on magic. Haruki said to Kagamitsu that he was right but Haruki's presence was pointless without sharing anything about the battle so he was rebelling in a crying mood. Haruki went to Akane and Karen and Karen asked where Kagamitsu was. Haruki said that he left. Akane asked him why he was crying while the one who should cry was her. Karen said to Haruki that those werewolves' fur would not fetch the same value. Akane said to Haruki that its efficiency might have changed also due to its discoloration so it was discoloration so it was impossible to calculate its value. Karen said to Haruki that she could buy them but the fair price might be lower. It would be a heavy loss for them and there was also Kegamitsu's reward and the dismantling cost to be paid to Akane and they had hunted so many, so they would manage somehow. Then Akane said to them that she would leave it to a detailed evaluation. Then Akane found part of the werewolf and said to Haruki that it was firm and durable and that it was difficult to find since it was superior to werewolves. Then Akane said to Haruki that the horns could not be good and durable for weapon processing. Akane cut off the werewolf's horns with her knife. Karen was surprised and asked Akane why she did that. Akane said to Haruki that when the werewolf was defeated it probably changed form and nature. Haruki thought it could be a good weapon and cried immediately. Haruki smelled the horn and found the horn smell spicy and he said to Akane and Karen that for the first time in a few years, they would be able to eat that. Meanwhile, Kagamitsu entered a secret room named the Hero and the Wind Room. Masatsugu was there and found it unusual to see him and greeted him. He asked Kagamitsu if something was up for Kagamitsu to call him out of the blue in that manner. Kagamitsu said to Masatsugu that it concerned Shinjuku's Operation Stampede. Kagamitsu continued to talk to Masatsugu and told him that the operation was successful, however he could not find the boss. 
Masatsugu said to Kagemitsu that the boss only had left his minions, discolored monsters, behind. Kagemitsu seemed anxious about that situation and told Masatsugu he had some ideas about the floor boss. Masatsugu asked him to explain in detail. Kagemitsu started to explain to Masatsugu that the missing deer had appeared in the garage dungeon in Hokkaido and Haruki's team, and he had teamed up to defeat it. The material of the werewolves that turned purple would arrive at Ichibishi's head office for detailed appraisal to confirm it. Then Kagemitsu asked Masatsugu if he was doubting his words. Masatsugu knew that it was about the dungeons so nothing would surprise him at that point. Masatsugu continued to speak and told him that the sky was the same by meaning the sky looked the same in all of the dungeons. Kagemitsu suggested that maybe all of the dungeons are connected to each other. Masatsugu seemed to like that idea and assimilated dungeons to the occult and said that there was no proof but there was also no basis for denying it. They did not know anything about dungeons but if it was the same boss then it was good news. They needed to handle this information properly, otherwise they were going to cause a lot of chaos. Masatsugu said that would take the credit away from him and his companions. Kagemitsu said that knowing there were monsters out there that could move freely between dungeons, he did not think any adventurer would mind it. Masatsugu supposed that it was also true. Kagemitsu said that he wanted to give Haruki's team something from him. It was unfortunate that there was nothing for him despite the fact that he also subdued the boss of Shinjuku. Masatsugu said that he understood and he would think about it. Besides, Masatsugu got curious about the guy who defeated the boss. Kagemitsu told Masatsugu that he had also met Haruki in Chikaho before, but Masatsugu didn't completely remember him. Kagemitsu told Masatsugu that he knew a mask-wearing guy who wielded a dagger and Masatsugu finally remembered him. He found Haruki's growth rate was beyond expectations. He was a threat. Masatsugu stood up and walked towards the room. He turned on the light in the room. He thought that if it was true he must have done what it took to get him on the team. Regardless, he was strong so it was fine. He asked himself what he should do. Masatsugu and his team had to keep the matter of suppression of the boss a secret. Masatsugu sent all of them gifts and one by one they decided to open their gift boxes. Karen was surprised that there was a bracelet in her box. She believed that a bracelet effectively utilizes her mana. The power she put in it thinned and dispersed throughout her body. Karen thought that the bracelet appeared to be a defensive enhancing item. After Karen, Haruki opened his box. He would be happy if it was a weapon. When Haruki opened his box it was different from what he thought was inside the box. Everyone was surprised and looked at what was inside the box and they found a scary mask. Haruki said it was a cursed no mask and shouted. There was also a note from Masatsugu so Karen decided to read the note. It was written that Mask, Shigama and company have caused you trouble before. I hope you accept the item as an apology. When the Shinjuku operation is done I would like to visit and make a formal apology. Haruki was crying and he said that his name was not Mask. It was Haruki. However for Karen Masatsugu recognized Haruki so it was fine. Karen said to Haruki that there was a manual for the mask. Karen was reading the note and learned information about the mask. The mask's name was Hidden Surface and its type was a mask with a super rarity and rare quality. The effect made the user's presence disappear. Haruki threw the mask away and he told them to get rid of that right away. Akane shouted and said to Haruki that it was a present from the hero Masatsugu. However, Haruki preferred to die instead of wearing that mask. He shouted that the mask was a terrifying present. Then all of a sudden Masatsugu entered the room with a hero's smile on his face. Masatsugu said to Haruki that he had thought Haruki was collecting strong masks so he had sent a strong one. Haruki was shouting and saying that he was not happy at all. Others were trying to convince him to wear the mask and Haruki was crying and shouting. Consequently it was decided to give the mask to Ria. Meanwhile Haruki and Akane were talking about how strong the werewolf was. Haruki said to Karen that since they had leveled up at the last battle, he believed that they would be okay. They would try things out along the way. Haruki looked at the skill board and told her that there were a lot of changes at that time. First, upgrades were completed and a few features were made available. Now Haruki could use the log function but he couldn't tell the changes. He still found it fun to satisfy one's curiosity. While Haruki was lost in his thoughts, Karen called out to him. Haruki, who came to his senses, told her that they needed to warm up as soon as possible. After they went a little further, three huge werewolves appeared in front of them. They started fighting and Haruki thought besides him, Karen and Rhea's attack powers were on a different level now. Then Haruki suddenly got injured by the werewolf. Karen ran up to him and asked what was wrong. Haruki wanted to act like it was okay and moved on. Even though Haruki took another blow, he finally managed to kill the werewolf. Later they went to Akane's shop and Haruki asked if there was anything that could cure him because he got roughed up. Akane asked Haruki what he was doing in those times. Akane continued to lecture him. She told him not to be a burden to his friends and told him that he should be grateful to them. Haruki was already aware of that and he told her that he came to seek advice. When he moved normally he was fine but when he was fighting the places where he was beaten were hurting. 
Akane was trying to figure out the problem of Haruki so she asked him what kind of pain he had. Haruki told her that it felt like an electric charge was coursing through his body like his nerves were being pulled out. It was similar to sciatica which refers to pain that travels along the path of the sciatic nerve. It could vary widely and it might have felt like a mild tingling, dull ache, or burning sensation. He asked Akane if she had a remedy for that, he would like to purchase some. Akane, after listening to Haruki, asked him if he was prepared to retire as an adventurer. Haruki and Karen were shocked and they didn't understand what Akane was trying to say. Haruki asked her to stop making jokes about him that were not funny at all. However, Akane was deadly serious. Haruki yelled at her to stop acting like that. Akane told him that his condition was different than he thought. Haruki didn't care and told her that he was not quitting. Akane asked him even if he was no longer human, would he not quit? Haruki was so confused and asked her what she was talking about. Akane told him that she only knew a small portion of that information, but it was the side effect of leveling up. If the monsters kept on leveling up rapidly, ordinary creatures would turn into monsters. Haruki and Karen were shocked after listening to Akane. They all knew that when someone leveled up, their body became stronger. Akane added that monsters in the dungeon built up their bodies in that manner and nobody could explain why or how that happened. She was questioning the whole thing to explain the situation better. What happened afterward when their body kept getting stronger after defeating numerous monsters? Experiments on animals demonstrated that the body had evolved. Ordinary animals had become monsters. In other words, it was very likely that the change in Haruki's body was the same phenomenon those animals experienced as Akane said. That was why his body hurt. Haruki was struggling to understand the fact that he was turning into a monster. Karen and him were upset about the situation. As Akane said before, she recommended Haruki to retire now. That was the best way to avoid becoming a monster. Haruki asked if there was someone else who experienced the same symptoms as him. Akane said there were a few, most were someone like him who leveled up quickly. Haruki was trying to find a remedy so asked Akane if there really was no specific medicine for that. However, sadly, as Akane said, there was none since it was not an injury or illness. Therefore, they all tried to accept that there was no cure. Akane asked about Haruki's decision. Haruki said that he wanted to continue being an adventurer. Akane asked him if it was just a facade. On top of being unable to fight due to severe pain, Haruki would eventually become a monster. He could hurt his companies or Karen as Akane said and asked Haruki again if he still intended to continue. Akane thought he was a fool but not to such an extent. She said that she knew what he felt and she had some unreliable info. Haruki asked immediately if she knew something. She opened a map and showed him a place. Akane told him there was a hot spring called Kamui Hot Spring in Asahikawa City. She heard that a hot spring gushed out from the dungeon there. There were claims that soaking yourself in such a hot spring might have prevented Haruki from becoming a monster. She didn't know if hot water would dissipate the energy that wasn't absorbed into your body or something. Haruki suddenly stood up and thanked Akane excitedly for telling him that information. Akane said that it was just a possibility so he shouldn't have expected too much. Haruki decided to strike the iron while it was hot so he went to get ready. Karen also decided to go with Haruki. She said that maybe she was turning into a monster too. However, Haruki didn't find that idea possible because Karen didn't have growth acceleration. Karen added that if she left him by himself he might have soaked in the heat for a long time. Who was going to look out for him in that kind of a situation? However, Haruki knew that he had to soak longer so he could heal quickly. If that was not, maybe he would drink the water or something to heal quickly. Akane told Karen to keep an eye on him, and Karen knew that she would. Later on they arrived at the hot spring. Karen couldn't help but think what a beautiful place it was. Haruki reminded her why they came there and they went inside. The receptionist men couldn't notice his presence and asked Karen if she wanted a room for one person. Haruki felt bad but tried to not lose his motivation. He got prepared and went to the hot spring. He was amazed that pain and motor dysfunction could be cured there. The hot spring felt like something was melting out of his mind or body. He wanted to focus on the treatment and tried to taste the water but it didn't feel like it was working. He tried to massage it then noticed Esta was also there. Esta thought it would be dangerous if he was left alone so she wanted to keep an eye on him. And he realized that Akane and Karen could be sent to Esta. At the dinner he talked about it to Karen but she still insisted on keeping an eye on him. While they were eating she asked if the hot spring seemed to work. He stated that it was good and the pain seemed to be easing for him. Karen was relieved and told him to not rush it and to heal properly. However, Haruki didn't want his body to get used to that and wondered if it would be okay to try mastering the maintenance of weapons at the same time. Meanwhile, Karen was happy that they could continue on adventuring once more after Haruki was fully recovered. After finishing their dinner, they noticed a poster on the wall announcing the start of the Asahikawa Dungeon Stampede Extermination Campaign. A man approached them and asked if they were also taking part. He explained that there had been a stampede in Kamui Kotan's dungeon and although it had subsided, their defense troops were still insufficient. Due to its unique topography, 
Kamui Kotan was considered an unexplored area after the stampede, there were still many monsters lurking there that had yet to be hunted. He also mentioned that the local government would give out rewards. Karen was looking at Haruki like she didn't want him to participate, so he said that even though he was interested in it, he had come there only for his treatment. When they were about to leave, Haruki heard some people participating because Kagamitsu was in command, and there would be featured on the blog of the top ranker in that subjugation. He was getting more and more interested when they said their blog would appear as rankers' blogs with a lot of access, and sponsors wouldn't ignore them. Karen knew that he would participate no matter what, and he said to her that in his every effort in preparation for the extermination campaign, he would put an effort to recover fully. In the next days, all they did was go to hot springs, eat good food, and rest. Haruki was thinking about his harsh moments with the monsters, and was glad that he was doing well now. Karen entered his room and asked if he was really participating in the extermination campaign in his condition. Haruki seemed confident as his body was light from two weeks of hot spring treatment, which was the perfect time to come back. However, Karen was still worried because they didn't know how strong or how many monsters there were. He patted her head and told her to not worry since Ariel was in command, they would tread cautiously when hunting. The thing Karen was worried about was that he would do something crazy again. The day of the extermination campaign arrived and there were lots of people came from different areas. Becky and Yoshi were chatting about BC's name on Kagamitsu's blog. It was exactly what they expected. Becky saw Kagamitsu trying to hide from people. Kagamitsu was nervous that there were a lot of people than he expected. However, when he saw Haruki standing there, his whole anxiety disappeared and he came out where he was hiding. He started to give his speech and informed everyone that they were unsure of what monsters were there so they should be careful. Meanwhile, an armored person was in the forest, standing majestically. Kagamitsu explained once again that he was the one who was in charge of overseeing and hosting there at the starting point, and Beki was in charge of the subjugation count. Their hunting grounds were the cast forests of Kamakotan and they would corner the monsters into a two-kilometer radius. Yossi, Dora, Neko, and Van were keeping an eye on the monsters to prevent them from straying too far from the area. Simultaneously, they were all keeping an eye on them to prevent cheating. There were three rules. First, they should avoid interfering or stealing from other persons or teams. Second, they need to keep the monsters from leaving the area. Last but not least, they should not be using any magic bags or magic items. They need to follow those three rules. Additionally, they would receive one point for themselves as well as the team they were part of each time they defeated a monster. Prizes were offered to the top three teams and players. The time limit was until evening so they got started right away. Haruki was amazed by the effects of the hot spring because his body felt so light. He got his first catch in a second and continued to move. Karen and others were consistently hunting without him instructing them as well. Karen didn't seem to like the combination Haruki came up with but bear with it. Suddenly, Rhea got too excited and she warned them if they get too hyped up, others might mistake them for something else. Even though she was wearing a mask to conceal her presence, however Karen felt like she was mocking her as the mask was too funny looking. A big brown bear monster appeared in the bushes. She couldn't use her magic and wasn't sure if she could really do it but she had to try even though she didn't know if it would work. She hit the bear with all her power and the bear was defeated. A girl named Dora came and congratulated her for defeating the bear and explained that it was a prey that gave her a special point. She seemed confused so Dora explained that it was actually a normal bear but after consuming monsters, its taste had developed to that of a monster so it was special. Before she left she said that if she took the bear to the starting point she could get points but the bear was too big to carry. Karen wondered if it was going well for Haruki and he was thinking about what to explore and saw a salmon monster which seemed quite tasty to him. When he was about to catch it, the salmon fish stopped him and said that she was the best salmon princess and her name was Chep, a mermaid and a spirit. Since it was still a monster, he caught her. She screamed for him to listen to her and it was the first time he had ever seen a monster pleading for its life, so it seemed worth listening. The fish asked if he was familiar with Kamui Rock and stated that she had to go to Kamui Rock no matter what. The reason for that was because she was the best salmon princess. Haruki didn't understand what was going on there. He started to think about if Kagamitsu and the others had chased the monster to Kamui Rock, and it seemed like an exhilarating. In addition to getting subjugation points, he would also get food ingredients so he decided to go to Kamui Rock. Reaching the rock would take some time so he decided to climb. The fish was impressed by his skills. He took a quick breath from climbing and noticed that it was huge but there wasn't any salmon clan there. The fish thought she was going to die before she was done with her business there. He ignored her and asked what business she would be doing there and she explained that she was offering herself to God. He continued to climb the rock while she was talking. Kamui Rock was the place where the evil god Nina Kamui fought against the hero Samaikuru, and Kamui Rock was believed to be a vestige of Samaikuru's attack, created as a result of Samaikuru's attack on Nina Kamui. Suddenly something appeared from the sky and hit the rock. 
The rock broke and Haruki felt a presence similar to a dungeon boss. A giant lizard came out from the crack and Haruki was speechless. Kagamitsu asked Becky about the situation, and she said that a big one had just been hunted by Haruki's team. The girl with the staff brought it. She mentioned that Haruki was indeed unpredictable. Kagamitsu recalled the time when Masatsugu told him to bring Haruki to Tokyo. He stated that with his ability he would be regarded even in Tokyo and his talent would be wasted if they left him in the countryside which means he passed Hokkaido's level as low. That made Kagamitsu even more mad. What he couldn't stand was he couldn't retort back. He told Becky that other teams must catch big ones too, and it was worrisome if it was only Haruki's team catching them. They then sensed the presence in the direction of Kamui Rock. Kagamitsu required a search team and he left it to the person in charge of communications. Haruki was trying to understand what kind of a monster he was facing and its presence was similar to the deer, which means it was a dungeon boss. The monster made an attack and he could barely dodge it. He realized that it could sense him which never happened before. The monster was also using magic so it got even more interesting. While fighting with it he noticed that its attacks were too shallow. Even though it was shallow, he couldn't get close to injure it. But he wasn't planning to give up so he tried to attack it faster and after a few more tries he managed to cut the monster in pieces. However his attacks were so strong that the Kamui rock broke. Kagamitsu and the others were trying to understand how was that possible. Beki informed Kagamitsu that the presence of the monster earlies disappeared. Yoshi asked what they were going to do. He told them to return to the headquarters while keeping a watch on the surroundings and he would inspect Kamui Rock as there may be some injured people. Meanwhile, Haruki was panicking since he broke the relic of legend the sacred ground of Ainu. A ball appeared behind him and he tried to understand what it was. The ball came at him and went right inside his body. The fish came and was about to scold him but Haruki held her and asked if she was the one who summoned the monster earlier. She explained that the monster from before was the one who did evil things in Kamui Kotan, and to defeat it, she was intended to be offered as a sacrifice to the god but he defeated it. He didn't want to believe her, but didn't insist on anything. He looked at the view of the dusk and wondered what time it was as the time limit was until dusk. He took her along with him and jumped on the rock. However, people were packing up their things when he arrived at the starting point. He saw Karen and she informed him that the tourney was long over. He was too tired to react and felt dizzy. Kagamitsu was at Kamui Rock and found Haruki's mask. Haruki was upset that they were at the third place and Karen tried to cheer him up. He mentioned that he gave it his all to defeat the monster and Kagamitsu appeared, wanting to hear more about the monster. Haruki asked if he could get points for the monster but the time was up so Kagamitsu told him to give up. He asked why he broke the Kamui rock and Haruki didn't consider that. That was not what was important at that moment, and Kagamitsu wanted to thank him for defeating the monster, but he wasn't praising him for being reckless by himself. They were not in the dungeon and there were a lot of adventurers today. They could have fought together. Haruki did the same thing with the deer too, so Kagamitsu told him to keep his judgment in check, as there was a difference between being courageous and being reckless. He sent Haruki to Karen and started to think about what to do with the corpse. Haruki went to Karen and told her what happened. He then took out Chep as she was not staying still there. Chep was angry that he kept her inside but he was just looking for the right time to introduce her. Karen was shocked and asked if that was a merfolk monster. Meanwhile, Kagamitsu was writing on his blog about today's winners and reading what people wrote. Akani arrived charismatically. Since her beloved disciple participated in the event it was natural for her to come. Kagamitsu showed her the catch and asked for her opinion. Akani said that it was a B-ranked demi-human which was the same level as the deer before. It was also her first time seeing something like that. She inquired to know where it came from but Kagamitsu had no idea. She asked about Becky's clairvoyance skill she was adept at finding enemies, but Kagamitsu said that it had sprung up suddenly. Akani said that the monster was quite unique and it was weird that a unique mysteriously strong species at Kamuikoten Dungeons level was unexpected. She already understood that Haruki was the one who defeated it as there was only one kind of wound mark on the corpse. Akani told him to think hard to protect him as he was an important sprout but the same goes for her too. He told her to contact headquarters if anything happened, but it was not enough for him to get sponsored. The next day Ched was worshipping Rhea. Karen stated that she had been like that since yesterday. Haruki guessed that Chet must be considering Rhea as her queen. They left them alone and Karen asked what they were going to do today. Haruki suggested clearing the Kamuikotan dungeon. When they arrived there were many people even though the contest was only yesterday. Haruki suggested going down the unpopular floor at once and adjusting the skill. They arrived and it seemed that no one didn't come there even though there weren't strong monsters. Haruki was looking at the skill board and noticed that a few features was unlocked on the skill board. It was probably about tree enhancement and allocating the three points was too high at best. It was a little too much of a cost just for trying something out. Karen suggested trying to allocate it to her magical power. 
Haruki didn't seem so sure about it, but she said that it wouldn't hurt him even if it failed, and she would give it her all to earn those three points again. Haruki was impressed because he had always calculated his losses more than his gains and was always afraid of failure. He stated that she looked more like a proper adventurer now and she got so shy. He then went first. Karen asked if it hurt, but it didn't seem like he was hurting. He stated that it felt different and there was not much change to his physical condition. He then allocated hers and she said that it was easier to handle the power compared to before. Rhea wanted him to do it too, so he allocated them as well. Chep was once again amazed by Rhea. When Haruki checked Chep's skill board, he noticed that she was indeed a princess, not just a divine protection, but a safeguard. He wondered why a hero god would give a blessing to a salmon. He didn't force himself to think about it, so he decided to observe for a bit. They moved on and killed a bunch of monsters on their way. While they were resting, Karen stated that the roots of that tree were the real trouble and not the monsters. Haruki agreed and mentioned that there wasn't any floor boss and they didn't catch anything that was tasty. Next was the innermost floor, and he wanted to at least face the last floor lord. They were also starving so they dreamt about getting Jingisukan when they got home. They proceeded to move to the next floor, and it was bigger than they had ever expected. It was the last floor's lord. Karen noticed the branches and Haruki thought those were roots but it was actually its branches. The tree started to attack them and they got ready to fight. After lots of long tries, they managed to defeat it. The boss was undoubtedly a tough one. It seemed that the dungeon lord couldn't be absorbed so he suggested to come back tomorrow. Chep wanted to go too since she didn't want Rhea to get hurt. They went home starving and there was Genghis Khan at the dinner. It was a Japanese grilled mutton dish prepared on a convex metal skillet or other grill. Mutton was something they hadn't had in a while so they were grateful. After dinner Haruki went to the hot spring. He didn't feel any kind of pain while fighting and was glad that he was fully recovered. While he was thinking the things they were going to do tomorrow, he heard a woman's voice. He couldn't believe his lack of presence was useful in a place like that. He saw the legs of the woman and she asked who she was. He tried to explain that it was an inevitable accident but the woman who talked was actually Chep. Since the hot spring had a good effect on the skin she wanted to try it out. Haruki was embarrassed that he got ahead of himself. The next day they were at the dungeon and started to resume their exploration. They haven't found the boss drop yet, and Haruki wonders if he has to sell the branches and roots. He then noticed something and Karen asked what was wrong. He saw a stone stage and no matter how they looked at it, it was an artifact. He explained what it was to Karen and mentioned that he had rarely seen something like that in a dungeon. Suddenly the part he was touching started to become darker, and they couldn't understand anything. When he checked the skill board, it said that he had succeeded in subjugating the giant dark tree. Three skill points are obtained for the first subjugation of a dungeon lord. He mentioned that the stone stage was a dungeon core which was believed to be a mass of energy that sustained the dungeon. Karen remembered that the article said it was like a jewel but no one had ever seen the real thing. He wondered if it was too plain to be noticed. Karen asked if it was really possible. Nothing happened when Karen touched it but when Haruki touched it, the skill board told him the absorbed energy from the dungeon core. They noticed that it only reacted to him. Haruki wondered if that meant he could get rid of the dungeons all over the world. He mentioned the thing that the skill board said to him. If he continued to absorb it until it withers, he could manage it. Karen said that if he absorbed it, it would affect his body. However, he said that it was unnecessary to make dungeons disappear. He wanted to protect his hometown. He was just one person and there was a limit to what he could save, but he wanted to try everything he could. After thinking for a while, Karen put her hand on the stage even though she knew she couldn't help. He told her to run with all her strength if the dungeon collapsed. He absorbed all the core's energy and the core was temporarily inactive. And it was said on the skill board that the next dungeon outbreak had been delayed. Karen wondered the situation and he explained that the dungeon wouldn't collapse but the core's energy had been absorbed by the skill board. Besides, the core seemed to be somewhat related to dungeon breaks. According to the skill board's log, he was able to delay its next dungeon break. Karen wondered if he was implying that going forward he would have to keep absorbing the core's energy. Even Haruki thought that it would be too much for a single person to handle. He couldn't believe he had control over the dungeon breaks. He got anxious that people would use him if they found out and he would be taken away as a dungeon pig. Karen asked if there were no other logs on the skill board. An item enhancement came out and it seemed like a good thing. He wondered if it was on the ground and if it perceived objects within range. Items above a certain level could not be enhanced, so he tried with the potato stone. However, he couldn't even see any difference. He told Rhea to shoot the stone at the giant tree and when she did, it created a huge explosion and damaged that awfully sturdy trunk. Karen asked what he was doing this time and he said that he learned how to enhance items so he was testing them. He could buy any ready-made products. He didn't have any excuses if he got caught. He tried on his mask and asked Karen if his presence increased as he allocated 2,000 points to enhance his mask. 
but unfortunately there wasn't any difference in his presence. Karen tried to cheer him up by saying there might be the possibility that its performance had increased like a defense power. Haruki said that their whole body was covered with faint light including Rhea and Chep, but compared to Karen it was weaker. She said it would be because of her magic as its source. Haruki wondered if she always saw that and she approved him. Haruki got hyped up thinking one day he would be able to use a magic sword. Suddenly a magic circle appeared on the stone stage and a door appeared. They decided to open it as there might be a reward for the boss. There were steep stairs and they climbed it one by one. At the end of the stairs they arrived at Kamui Koten's forest. Haruki was upset that there wasn't an award. Chep asked for help and she didn't seem very well. When he was about to help her, she turned into an armored soldier. The dungeon's will created spirits that sought out qualified individuals and led them to the trials as challengers. These spirits were summoned as needed and disappeared like bubbles once their task was complete. Chep herself was one such spirit created by the dungeon's will. However, like a god's prank, she had an ego. While she was at the sea, she was Haruki and thought he was a human with unprecedented strength, the designated one. However, he was rude and weird and mistook her as a monster. Karen also didn't seem like the destinated one. She only liked Rhea and she had fun. She wanted to stay with them longer and longer. Haruki was trying to understand what it was. They both noticed that the monster's body had layers of magical power that were incomparable to anything they had encountered before. However, there was no sign of murder intent or movement. They lacked information so he decided to return before it moved. He told Chep that they were leaving but then another magic circle appeared and the monster's sword came. The monster made a sudden attack that he couldn't even see but fortunately his reflexes were stronger. Rhea and Esta attacked it but the monster was too strong for them to handle. Haruki also attacked it with almost all his power but it was helpless. Even Rhea's upgraded potato stones couldn't get through. Unlike the other monsters, this one was different and it indeed came to crush them. Karen said that while she was distracting the monster with her lightning power, they should retreat. However, Haruki's body collapsed and he noticed that he wasn't fully recovered. Karen was having a hard time fighting with the monster and she fainted at some point. Haruki was desperately trying to move his body to save Karen and the others, but he couldn't. The monster was about to crush his head when Esta shielded herself to save him. Rhea also helped but it was pointless. His body wasn't moving and this one was on a different level. He expressed his frustration and discontent with his unfortunate circumstances by cursing. Haruki didn't want to lose and save everyone around him so he pulled himself together and used his last strengths to dodge the monster's attacks. He was lucky enough to get out of the way in time but now they had to think about something that would help him. He wondered if that was also part of the dungeon. Long ago an evil god had arrived at Kamuikotan and he had sunk the Ainus, who went both up and down the stream of the river. In order to subdue the evil god, Samaikuru took a stand. Samtashkuru and the Ainus who resided in Kamuikotan, along with other spirits, joined forces to defeat the evil god that had threatened that place. Since then, the Ainu started to offer them the best salmon they could fish out of the river to thank the gods. That was the legend of Kamuikotan. Haruki now understood that it was a derivative quest. The battle in Kamui Rock wasn't over. The site where the fierce battle between Samaikuru and the evil god once took place. Chep was an offering to God and she was meant to control the progress of that request. If the Black Knight was a proxy of the evil god, they were Samaikurus. He checked the skill board and he was right. That was in the dungeon. The monster attacked him again and since he wasn't fully recovered he fell on the ground. He couldn't move the way he wanted and he was the only one who left which means he can't fall there. The monster was making attacks on attacks and he was barely getting away. He asked Rhea if she was okay and even though she didn't seem like it, she didn't say anything. Esta's body was cracked and she was still acting like she could help. Haruki, Rhea and Esta used their last powers to defeat the monster but it was so tough that it didn't affect him at all. When the Black Knight attacked him with his sword again, Esta saved Haruki. He told her to not overdo it as she was his important friend. Haruki was trying to come up with ideas to defeat their opponent. He eventually had an idea and instructed Rhea to aim for the opponent's body while he would attack his head. Haruki had noticed that their opponent had been responding more to Rhea's attacks with a potato than to his actual attacks. During their fight, Haruki instructed Rhea to attack the opponent's head with full force. Haruki then used his speed to distract their opponent while Rhea was in the middle of the intensive attack. The attacks did not work at first, but when they attacked together simultaneously, it seemed that they were able to damage their opponent. However, Haruki and Rhea's strengths had limits and they were getting weaker. Karen appeared and joined the fight, injuring their opponent as payback. Haruki was overjoyed and surprised to see Karen alive. That is the end of the recap for now please read the pinned comment about the next part.